Today we're going to take a look at accuracy and precision as well as their counterparts systematic error and random uncertainty. Ordinarily when we use the words accuracy and precision in everyday life we mean the same thing but your English teacher might say to you what you've said is very very precise but it's completely inaccurate and what she would mean is that you said precisely what you meant to say. You've used lots of adjectives. So it was a very precise statement. But it's inaccurate because, for instance, it wasn't really a metaphor. You were totally wrong in what you said, but you said it very, very precisely. I like to think that Shock O'Neill was a very precise free throw shooter. He just wasn't very accurate. So he'd put up all kinds of shots and they'd always hit the back of the rim in the same spot. He had no arc on his shot and they'd always hit the back of the rim and then they'd bounce back out again. So he was precise because he always hit the same spot. He just wasn't accurate. He wasn't getting any extra points for the free throws. When we talk about accuracy and precision in experiments, we usually make another analogy to an archer shooting at a target. So whenever you do an experiment, there is a true value. If I drop a ball from a certain height and there's a certain amount of air friction, then mathematically there's a true value that we should get for the drop time. And if we take a lot of measurements, the average of that drop time should get closer, should converge towards the true value for that measurement. So this archer here, he might not be a very good shot, but maybe his shots all circle around the true value. That would be an indication of high accuracy. That averaging to the true value is a sign of high accuracy. It's low precision. He's not a particularly good shot. If you're making the measurement, dropping the ball, Maybe your human reaction time is throwing a lot of randomness into your results, but if you measure it enough times, it should average to the true value. Now, he could be a very precise shooter, but let's say there was some sort of optical illusion set up with mirrors or lenses. So all his shots were very close together, but well off the true value. So we would say that this was high precision, but low accuracy. Kind of like Shock O'Neill. So whenever we have poor precision, that's going to be caused, always caused, by large random uncertainty. So you take exactly the same measurement many times, and you're getting values that are all over the place. So there's a random aspect to the values that you're getting from your measurements. Whenever you have poor accuracy, that will be caused by large systematic errors. So for the archer here, some sort of optical illusion was leading to all of his arrows going off to the left. If you're dropping the ball, maybe your stopwatch is not properly calibrated. So all of your time measurements are off by perhaps two hundredths of a second or something like that. So a systematic error shifts all the values in one direction. So systematic error is typically caused by calibration error. So for instance, maybe you close this caliper and yet you look here and it's not reading zero. That means you have a calibration error but you would be able to correct for it by adding or subtracting that amount from your measurements. Or perhaps there's nothing on your scale and you notice that there's a reading on your scale. That's going to throw all of your measurements off by that amount. So typically we can correct for systematic error. And in that case it wouldn't be a problem. But sometimes it's more complicated than that. For instance if you're looking at a graduated cylinder and you're making your measurements here.
But for some reason, you're not able to have your eyeball such that you're looking directly across at the graduated cylinder. You're looking down at an angle. That's going to throw your measurements off. All of the measurements are going to be shifted in the same direction, as long as you're always looking from above. But it's unlikely that this angle here is going to remain the same every time. So there's an element of randomness to your systematic error, and that means you're not going to be able to correct for it. Sometimes it is not possible to correct for systematic error because there is a random aspect to it. So it's nice when you can correct for it, it's not a problem, but sometimes, and this comes up more frequently than you'd like it to, you can't make a correction. Let's do a numerical example to make more sense of all this. So we're going to drop a ball from 5 meters. It's in a vacuum environment. We're simply using a stopwatch to time it to fall those 5 meters. And we do five trials and we get these values here. Now unfortunately, there was a systematic error. The stopwatch always started at 0.03 seconds. That means all of these values are going to be too high by 0.03 seconds. And when we take an average of those values, we get 1.032 seconds. The true value to fall 5 meters in a vacuum is 1.01 seconds, which is to say that while well, we can see with our five values here that there's a big spread in our repeated measurement. And it's well off from the true value. So we've got a situation kind of like this, where we've got poor accuracy and poor precision. A large spread in our values, and also a big discrepancy between our average value and the true value. So we've got poor accuracy and poor precision. So our first step now to improve our results would be to correct for that systematic error. So we're going to subtract 0 0.03 seconds for all those times, and we'd get these times here, which gives us an average time which is much closer to the true value. So now we've become quite accurate, but we've still got lots of spread to our times, and that indicates poor precision. So our individual values are still well away from the true value, but they're averaging much closer to that true value. Now you might see a graphical representation of your data. So the graph would have the number of measurements against, in this case, time, and there'd be a true value for the time. So originally, our values were too high, the, above the true value, and they were well spread out. So the peak would represent the average value, and then the width of this bell shape would represent the spread in values. So what we've now done is we've moved back by correcting for the systematic error so that our peak lies over top of the true value now. The next thing we'd like to be able to do is make that peak much narrower. So as we continue to refine this experiment, our next step would likely be to use something like a photogate timer so that you could reduce the random uncertainty created by fluctuations in human reaction time when you're using a stopwatch. So now you can see there's a small spread in the values for the same measurement. And you can see that to three significant digits, the average value is equal to the true value now. So now we would have both high accuracy and high precision. And if we made our graph showing the true value, say here, all of our measurements 
would be closely spaced around that true value. And ideally, that's what we'd like to have when we do an experiment. Okay, let's try a question. Pause the video, try the question, come back for the answer. Let's begin with a little multiple choice hint. Even if you knew nothing about accuracy and precision, you should take note that these three answers have the word always in them. That's a stronger condition. And often it's an indication that that's a false response. So just based on that, you might guess that the correct answer is A. But let's go through B, C, and D and see why they are false. In B, a measurement that is precise might or might not be accurate, right? They're independent of each other. In C, a measurement that is not precise will always be inaccurate. No, once again, precision and accuracy are independent of each other. One does not imply the other. Repeated measurements will always increase accuracy and precision. Well, repeated measurements always increase precision, but they don't help with the accuracy because there's some systematic error that's not going to be corrected for by more measurements. So the correct answer is A here, which is really saying that precision and accuracy are independent of one another. Let's summarize the big ideas from the video. We started off with the idea of precision and accuracy. And we said that precision was affected by random uncertainty. Whereas accuracy was affected by systematic error. Now take note, these are not mistakes. If you make a mistake in your lab, redo the measurements. What we're talking about here is these are inherent limitations to your measurements. It's part of the equipment that you're using, and all experiments have random uncertainty and systematic error. That's just part of the game. So don't complain about them, and don't confuse them with mistakes. We said that sometimes we can correct for systematic error. And we said that random uncertainty can be improved using better measuring techniques or by doing more measurements. However, doing more measurements has no effect on the systematic error. So more measurements has no effect on systematic error. So please take the time to like videos, to make comments, to ask questions, become a subscriber, sign up for notifications, become a member or a Patreon. And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.